How many of you have traveled in another country where you didn't know the language? Okay. So a lot of you have never traveled in another country where you didn't know the language? You, you haven't or you have? You have, oh, okay. So who has never traveled in another country where you didn't know the language? You never went to, to the south, like to Atlanta? <laughs> Um, how many of you have ever traveled or spent time with somebody who's hard of hearing if you're married I'm not talking about the selective hearing (laughs) my friend Dan has a uh, hearing piece that has been implanted into his brain and it goes, and it connects, so he actually, the, the, the ear where the hearing piece is, that no longer functions at all. Um, and then he has a hearing aid in the other ear to try to assist what this mechanical tool, computerized tool, does for him in hearing. Uh, however, in a room where there's any kind of noise, he hears everything, which means he hears nothing. So unless you're just talking with him in a silent room with just you and him, then he can hear you clearly. But in a room where there's music playing, where there's traffic, where there's people talking, he can't hear anything. That made it a little bit challenging this week as he and I tried to both communicate with one another and as we tried to travel around and learn things about the country. He actually, get this one, some of you will laugh at this one. He thanked me for my Spanish. <laughs> yeah, yeah, my, my buenos dias, <laughs> my muchas gracias. <laughs> um, yeah, that, I think that's about all I have. <laughs> Um, yeah, yeah. I, 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 I did remember yo tengo un amigo que me ama, su nombre es Jesús, and that helps me when they say what's you know you know, you know say, su nombre, you know, what's your name you know when you say me ama Bill or so, so yeah I was able to get around a little bit, um, but it was interesting. It was it sh- it demonstrated something the importance of community, the body. And when one part of your body is not working well, it makes life very difficult, very difficult. Uh, one day, Dan went out on the beach, and it was raining, and he got his, his earpiece wet. Now, the bad thing, is this earpiece is supposed to allow him to swim underwater like 10 or 12 feet deep, but it couldn't handle a rainstorm that was not that wet. And it stopped functioning. And what was really a bummer was that night, Dan... And three other individuals had been invited to dinner with their guests with the second vice president of Home Depot. Second vice president, that means like she's like pretty important. And, and so we were, did work it out so that Dan could sit next to her so that part of his hearing aid, because this was the night the, the, this hearing thing's not functioning, right? So he's got this other hearing aid, he's trying to make that work and all. And, and so then we're trying to interpret for him and help him hear what's going on. It, it, you know, our bodies have been intricately and, and amazingly made, haven't they? And, and every part is important in your body. Every part. And, and God knows that, and God's designed us that way. And it's not an accident when God says, we are the body of Christ. Not you are the body of Christ, and you are the body of Christ, and you are the body of Christ, but we are are the body of Christ. And in fact, I don't want to uh, startle you or surprise you or scare you, but we're not the whole body of Christ either. In fact, portions of the body of Christ are meeting all across this mountain right now and around the world. Some have worshiped in many different places, many different languages, many different styles of worship. 
many different groupings and denominations with different types of leadership and all that and ecclesiastical construction, if you would. But we all, who call ourselves by the name of Jesus Christ, are that body of Christ. And we need each other. And folks, I need to tell you this, that the only thing that keeps us from really sharing with one another is pride. It's our pride that will keep us from being open with somebody else. It's our pride that will keep us from sharing things that are difficult because we're going to make it on our own because we're independent because we're American, that's why, right? Folks, it goes totally against the teaching of the word of Scripture. It goes against what Jesus tried to teach us. We together form one body. And as Paul says, in more than one place, we need each other. We are, get this word, members one of another. So today we're going to be talking about membership, being members one of another. In, in that sense, we belong to each other. We care, hopefully, about each other. We're supposed to support one another. That's what's been happening. For some of you who don't know it, for the last few days, Virgil Stowe had surgery in the middle of the week. While he was in having surgery, Jan had some kind of heart problem. They didn't know exactly what. And so Virgil's down there ready to come home. They want to kick him out. And they've got Jan in another place of emergency examining her for possible heart attack or something like that. And so now Virgil's, what are they going to do? Dump him out on the road? <laughs> and so fortunately his daughter was there, but his daughter was leaving. And so she was, I think, with mom. And, and it, it was really a challenge. Well, the doctor then said that Jan and Virgil, because now they're both in trouble, were, they were coming home, but they weren't allowed to be alone at home. How would you like to have somebody move into your house without warning and stay with you, different people, night and day? Are you ready for that? Right now. We're coming over right after worship and we're going to spend the next week at your house watching you and making sure that you're okay. Kind of works on your pride, doesn't it? The whole humility question. Uh, the whole supporting and caring. And, and, and then, when you're there, you got to watch out for this too. Don't you need to give them some space? <laughs> oh, no, no, you're there to talk to them, right? Oh, no, this guy just had surgery. You're there to let him rest. <laughs> Stay out of the way. I mean, it's all kinds of unusual things and, and beautiful things that were happening as people were caring for Jan and Virgil. And I confess that I'm mindful of the fact that Jan and Virgil won't always be with us. And please, I'm not putting anything on them. But it just, it, the frailty of life. Virgil's what now, 87 years old? Three years young, however you want to describe that. And things happen. You see, if you love people, you care. You care about them. They become a part of who you are. And that's the way it should be with the body of Christ. So look at Colossians, the third chapter. There's a lot of instructions here. Way more than I can cover this morning. Third chapter. And we're just going to read verses 12 to 17. And as Paul's preparing this, he's really talking about how you've become a brand new person in Jesus Christ. And then he says, therefore, because you're a brand new person in Jesus Christ, verse 12, therefore, as God's chosen people, Holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive whatever grievances you may have against one another. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. 
And over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body, you were called to peace. And be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom. And as you sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs with gratitude in your hearts to God. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. If there's one takeaway I would want you to to get a hold of today, this is that as the body of Christ, you wear Jesus. You wear the clothing of Jesus Christ on you. Same thing is true of a church. As a church, we wear Jesus Christ on us. We are clothed by him. And when we're out in our community, we want people to be able to see that clothing, the covering of Jesus Christ on us each one of us. God's people are chosen and they should be clothed with God. So my question for you this morning is how, maybe it should adjust it just slightly, how well are you wearing Jesus? You're chosen by God. Different than Israel, right? Israel was chosen with a responsibility to to be God's people, with a covenant people. We are chosen to be a light to the world. Slightly different than the choosing of Israel. We're chosen as God's people. You've been chosen to receive grace. That's what it means. You've been, you are special because God loves you. I know he loves everybody. So does that still make you special? Yes, yes, because he still chose you individually, personally, called you to himself, invited you to be his adopted child because he loves you. Does he know the details of your life (laughs) better than you do? (laughs) He knows the sins you've forgotten, okay? And he has forgiven. He knows you. So he says, now clothe yourself. Clothe yourself with Jesus. Wear things like this, compassion. This is a a tender love for other people. It's the, it's the, the, the tenderness you have when you're standing at the graveside of somebody. It's 2 Corinthians, God the God of peace and the father of compassion who comforts us so that we can comfort one another. Wear kindness. (laughs) Do you you wear that, that attitude where you're kind to people around you or are you impatient with those people that work around you and, and don't serve you the way you want to be served or whatever it might be. You wear humility. Humility, notice it doesn't say, are you humiliated? Do you wear humility? A right perspective of yourself that's not too high. But folks, there's a self-centeredness that comes also when your view is too low. And you're, oh, I'm bad, I'm terrible. Stop whining because you're just focusing on yourself. Oh, I'm great. I, you know, I'm, I'm not like that other person. You're the publicans. You're, excuse me. You're the Pharisee standing over there looking at the publican and saying, thank God I'm not as messed up and screwed up as they are. Humility. I call it a right perspective of yourself. Maybe it should be a God perspective of ourselves. Gentleness. Gentleness has to do with anger, folks. Anger, strength power under control. The gentle person could react with rage, could beat up somebody and chooses not to. Gentleness. Is that what happened with the man who died this week? Gentleness, anger, strength, power under control. Patience, that has to do with being slow to get angry. 
turning the fuse off, extinguishing the flame when you're starting to get ticked. <laughs> and folks, please don't listen to that statement that is said, don't pray for patience. I got to warn you, that's dumb. And here's why it's dumb. You're going to have trials. They're coming no matter what you do. Wouldn't it be better to pray for patience than to get the trial and not know how to handle it? People have said, oh, but if you pray for patience, then bad things are going to happen. My point is, bad things will happen regardless. So let's ask for the grace of God in how we respond to those things that happen to us. Patience. And then, then Paul says, bear with one another. <laughs> Oh, that's what you have to do every Sunday when you come here, right? <laughs> Bear with one another. And, you know, the idiosyncrasies of the people that stand up on this platform and all that kind of stuff. Bear with one another, he says, in love. Put up. It's more than put up, though, isn't it? It's not, you know, okay, I'm going to get through this, suffer through. No, no. To bear with, it means you're really going to care about that other person. You're going to recognize that they're imperfect, but you also know you're imperfect too. And you're not going to hold the things against them that they may do because they're imperfect. So you bear with them. And then Paul says, so the, really the key to this is forgive just as you've been forgiven. Let it go. Forgiveness, notice he doesn't say forget, does he? To forgive is to actually admit and recognize that you've been wronged, you've been hurt. But you say, I am not going to hold this against them. I'm not going to count this against them. In fact, forgiveness is one of those things we do. Why? Jesus said, because I've forgiven you. And he told a few stories about that, didn't he? How can we forgive? How can we say we've accepted his forgiveness this incredible debt that's been paid for us and then go and not forgive our brother who does not have the debt we have. Forgive one another. Bear with each other's imperfections. Be compassionate, humble, gentle, patient. And probably the way he kind of capsulizes all that is when Paul says, let the peace of Christ rule your heart. I used to do a lot of soccer refereeing, and it was my job to rule the peace on the field. <laughs> the more, the more uh, hostile the, the, the teams became, the more responsibility I had to rule the peace. So the louder the whistle blew, the more cards I used to lift, throw in the air, the more people I might have to remove from the game, including the coach or the parents, so sometimes the worst. It was my job, and that's what this word is here. To, to rule is, is the, the umpire, the referee out there on the field that's keeping the peace so that people don't kill each other or hurt each other. Is peace the umpire in your heart? Kent Hughes said, when there is peace in the heart, there will be praise on the lips. The Christian out of God's will is never found giving sincere praise to God. There was a story told of a um, wounded soldier. And I, this was in the Daily Bread, and I, they didn't really give the details of what battle it was or anything. But the soldier had been taken to a hospital tent uh, by some of his, his friends, after they had carried him a short distance, they didn't even get him to the tent. And he said, you need to put me down. This young man knew he was about to die. He said, look, you need to put me down and you need to go back and get someone else that's going to survive and get them to the hospital instead. And so they do it. They place him on the ground and they leave to go pick up some other soldiers. An officer comes to him and tries to help him out. And he can tell that this young man's going to die. The young man says, sir, I just have one request. Sir. And then the, the officer tries to offer him water and some other things. No, no, no. I just have one request. I have a little Bible in my, in my back pocket. Would you take it out? 
And I want you to read one verse to me, please. The verse is John 14, verse 27. The officer opened up the Bible and found the passage and he read to the young man, peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you. Not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. The soldier turns to the officer, thank you, sir. And his next words were in front of Jesus. A young man had peace ruling his heart. Does peace rule your heart? Paul says we are members of one body. We literally are members of one another. But I need to warn you, if we are disobedient to Christ, then it's going to bring discord and disharmony and pain and frustration to the body. <laughs> this, this last week, we, there were, I guess, about, from what I hear, about 20% of the people that were there that got sick. You know, in Mexico, we call it Montezuma's Revenge. I don't know what they called it down there. Sugar cane revenge, who knows? We, ate, we, all, we, we all had the opportunity to drink the Mama Juana. Have any of you had Mama Juana? Mama Juana is supposedly a medicine. It's got rum and sugar cane and a whole bunch of other stuff that like, looks like roots in the bottle. And it's supposed to heal you of anything. Uh, uh, they said it's an aphrodisiac. I mean, it, they went on to all kinds of things that it supposedly does. Um, so I don't know. I guess they didn't drink the Mama Juana. Folks, in the body of Christ, people are getting sick because of disobedience. The church is sick because of disobedience. We learned a lot about this as we went through the spiritual warfare series. That as we disobey Christ, each, any one of us individually, we bring sickness into the body, don't we? And that sickness as we disobey Christ is gonna develop into other things. Discord will start to occur and, and there will be dissension and dissension will lead to deceit and deceit will lead to disunity and more disobedience. We are members of one body with a responsibility to each other. But Paul goes on in the text and he says, and over all these virtues put on love which binds them all together in perfect unity. Will I complain about you if I really love you? Will I criticize and put you down? Will I reject you if I love you? We're called to put love on for each other. But here's an interesting one. If I don't know your name, do I really love you? We sometimes throw that phrase around, I love you. I love chocolate, had a lot of it this week. Love ice cream even more, had a lot of it too. But if I don't know your name, do I really love you? If I don't know what's happening in your life, do I really have the privilege of loving you? And you're sitting there saying, well, I don't want you to know, Bill. I'd like it, you know, I like to keep secrets from you so you don't know my weak sides and bad sides. And then you won't love me if you really know me. No, and unless I know you, I really can't love you. It takes that vulnerability, doesn't it? It takes us working at all those other things in order for us to love one another. So he says, clothe yourselves with what? With love. Put it all around you. Bind it all together. Tie up everything you're wearing and you're gonna have perfect unity then. And then as the peace of Christ rules in your heart, since as members of one body you were called to peace and be what? 
I'm sorry, I must have jumped ahead. You didn't catch it. And be what? Be thankful. Be thankful. Now, this is worship, folks. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom as you sing psalms. How can I teach if I don't really know what's going on in your life? And you, me. How can you admonish me? Now, notice it didn't just say, you know, hey, tell him how bad he is. <laughs> okay? Admonishment is about an understanding of another person recognizing their weaknesses and their strengths and helping them to grow into something more. Admonishment isn't about putting them down and messing them up and beating them up and saying how bad they are. And then you go away, oh, you're not loved here. No, no. Admonishment is because you love. Hebrews says that the father disciplines those he loves. You look at a child that's not being disciplined and you'll see a child that's not being fully loved. And the same thing in the body of Christ. No, I'm, it's not about criticism. It's not about gossip and going and talking about someone to somebody else. It's about going face to face to a person and saying, I care so much about you. I'm concerned about what I see. Because I what? Love you. This is why we do life groups. Nothing sacred about them. But I understand it's one of the reasons why people don't do life groups. Right? Because we don't want somebody to get too close. <laughs> we don't want somebody to know the stuff. And yet Christ is inviting us to clothe ourselves with a love for one, one another, which will cause us to be thankful, which will cause us to teach each other from the word of God, helping one another to apply the living word to our lives and teach us to even admonish one another. And you'll accept admonishment from somebody you know cares about you. Matthew Henry said, let me be thankful first because I was never robbed before. I, I, I messed up the story. <laughs> Matthew Henry got robbed. He's a commentator. Uh, he wrote the Matthew Henry's commentary. Some of you maybe have studied that, read that. And, and he gets robbed and, he's, and he says, let me be thankful first because I was never robbed before. <laughs> Second, because although he took my purse, he did not take my life. Third, because although he took all I possessed, it was not much. <laughs> and fourth, because it was I who was robbed and not I who robbed. There are things and ways that you can be thankful regardless of the circumstances. Vine in his commentary says, where love is in exercise and where the peace of Christ rules, thankfulness is inevitably produced. And that out of a sense of entire indebtedness to God for what was wrought by him in Christ to bring about that peace and out of a sense of deep gratitude for it and its governing power. Or McDonald says it this way. Be thankful. This repeat, re refrain is repeated over and over again in Paul's writings. There must have been a good reason. Yeah. <laughs> the Spirit of God must consider a thankful spirit very important. Do you think? And we believe that it is important not only for a person's spiritual life, but for his physical welfare as well. Doctors have found out what the scriptures have taught through the years, that a cheerful, thankful attitude of mind is beneficial for the body. And that worry, depression, and a complaining spirit are definitely harmful to one's health. And French. That was my commentary, sorry. McDonald goes on, usually we think of thankfulness as something that is determined by our immediate circumstances. But Paul here shows that it is a grace to be cultivated. We are responsible to be thankful. Of all peoples of the world, we have the most for which to give thanks. The fault is not in any lack of subject matter, but only in our selfish hearts. Let the word of Christ dwell in you. And I love how he says it. Let it dwell richly in you. Rick Penner says, throw open the doors. Roll out the red carpet and give it a grand reception. If you'll let the word dwell in you in this way, it will produce an amazing amount of spiritual wealth in your life. H.A. Ironside told of visiting a godly Irishman named Aaron Andrew Frazier 
who had come to Southern California to recover from a serious illness. Though quite weak, he opened up his worn Bible and began expounding the deep truths of God in a way that Ironside, this great preacher, had never heard before. Ironside was so moved by Fraser's words that he asked him, where did you get these things? Could you tell me where I could find a book that would open them up to me? Did you learn them in some seminary or college? The sickly man gave an answer that Ironside said he would never forget. My dear young man, I learned these things on my knees on the mud floor of a little sod, sod cottage in the north of Ireland. There with my open Bible before me, I used to kneel for hours at a time and ask the Spirit of God to reveal Christ to my soul and to open up the word to my heart. He taught me more on my knees on that mud floor than I ever could have learned in all the seminaries or colleges in the world. Are you taking the time to get down with the living word of God and to meet the author face to face as he talks to you from his word. What most people do is they read about the Bible rather than reading the Bible. There's wonderful, incredible, great devotionals out there and I encourage that. But don't stop with the devotional. Read the word. It's alive, sharper than any two-edged sword. It'll pierce deep to the bone and the marrow. It's full of, and God breathed from the Spirit of God himself. Read the Bible. Spend the time on the floor if you have to, hours at a time, and just see what God has to say to you. Because he wants to minister to you. And then as Paul ends this text, he says, and whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Everything you do, do it in the name of the Lord. In your bulletin today is a covenant. Would you mind taking that out? And by the way, there's two copies in there. And you're wondering, why are there two copies in my bulletin? I must have got somebody else's. Nope, you got one for two for you. Today is our... Covenant Sunday. It's our day in which we commit ourselves as members of this church. It's an annual thing that we do for our guests. Every year we have a covenanting Sunday in which we renew our commitment to this ministry. But what does that mean? If you look in your covenant card, it's built on our mission statement that we are putting legs to faith. We're attempting to become a relational church that is sold out for Jesus Christ. When I say putting legs to faith, that's what we've been teaching on for the last month. Loving God, the first priority is for us to love God. And right with that, Jesus said, you love God and you love one another. Secondly is to encourage one another, to come alongside of each, each other, where we minister to each other, like this text this morning was saying, even admonishing and teaching each other. The word of God should be applied to our lives, not just read, but it should be lived out. Thirdly, we are supposed to be growing as Christ's disciples. And as we grow as Christ's disciples, we should be helping somebody else to grow. It's about growing in community and in fellowship. And it's about discipling others and helping them to become more like Jesus Christ. And lastly, it's about sharing Jesus. Folks, there is nothing more selfish. Nothing more selfish than to know that Jesus Christ loves you, died for you. You've got your name written in the Lamb's Book of Life and you don't share it.